When you read 1 Peter in its context, Peter is writing to first century Christians who are under attack by Nero and the Roman government. So there's a lot of persecution going on. Peter is looking forward to the end of time when God's people will be under persecution. And Peter is encouraging his audience, just as he would be encouraging us, to live triumphantly, to not lose hope, to not lose faith in Christ, and to not lose sight of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. We are to be obedient to God's Word, despite the world's negativity toward God's Word. By living for Christ, <coughs> our lives testify. Because people will go, they want to know less about what we believe and more about who we believe in. And Peter's point is clear. God didn't send us into the world as vacationers on a self-guided tour waiting for the guide to take us home. We are not on a playground, but we are soldiers on a tour of duty. Amen. We are not called to sit back and relax and take in the scenery. And this past week we've heard a lot about D-Day and the invasion of Normandy, about, yet, about thousands of young men who gave their lives for the sacrifice of freedom. Amen. Peter tells us that we are engaged in a conflict on foreign soil and that we need to arm ourselves for the spiritual battle that lies ahead of us. If you notice chapter 4 and verse 1, Peter says, Since Christ suffered physically, you too might suffer. And so arm yourselves with the same attitude that he had. He who is willing to suffer for Christ shows that he has turned his back on sin. And if you think of the context of Peter's writing, when Jesus was, be was beaten and abused by Roman soldiers, he was spit upon, he had a crown of thorns thrust on his head, he marched down that road to the cross, he was nailed on the cross, he was ridiculed and humiliated, but his response to his accusers was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Here is the creator of the universe. Here is the almighty God being humbled and humiliated. And Peter says, we need to have that kind of attitude, to arm ourselves. So when we are tempted to be angry, or when we're tempted to seek revenge, or when we're tempted to get even with people or to stab them in the back, Peter says as Christians, we are to arm ourselves with the attitude that Jesus had. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Dropping down to verse 7, he says, The end of all things is near. Now Peter had no idea 2,000 years later we'd still be here. In fact, we really shouldn't still be here, should we? <laughs> Amen. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. Peter says that we need to keep our minds clear, uncluttered, so that we know not only how to pray, but what to pray for. And he goes, it is the end of all things. He says, the end of all things is near. And that word end does not necessarily mean the sensation, the cessation of things. Rather, it means the fulfillment of all things. The fulfillment of all things is near. And as we study prophecy, and as we look at world events, it's clear that Jesus coming is sooner than we believe, sooner than we recognize. He says, therefore, be clear-minded and self-control so that you can pray. It's kind of hard to pray as in when you're out of control. Yeah. It's 
more tempting to be out of control and do things that we later regret. But when we're listening to the voice of Jesus and taking the attitude of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, it's in those moments of crisis that we know what to pray, who to pray for. Amen. And to be clear-minded means that we must be biblically based so that we're not caught up in, in confusion and, and become depressed and discouraged. And so that we also don't become fanatical. Now, fanatical is kind of a funny word because in, in, the, in the world, if you go to church every week, you're considered a fanatic. So I guess we're fanatics. Amen. That's a good thing, eh? Amen. For some people, going to church is something they do twice a year, Christmas and Easter. And, and Peter is warning us that because in the last days, Satan unleashes a war against the human mind. So he tells us we need to have good, good judgment so that we can pray. And Peter tells us that we need to be committed as prayer warriors, willing to spend time with God in prayer, to become better acquainted with our God, so that our minds can be clear as we're in the midst of the battle, so that when people ask us or people we encounter, that we know what to say to them about Jesus. And we can't be clear-minded if we're not praying. Amen. It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Clear-mindedness comes because we're praying. And clear-mindedness comes because we're spending time in God's Word. Their mindedness helps us to be ready for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Because many of the world will be caught off guard. But God's people will say, here is our God who we have waited for. And when Christ comes, he will call us by our names. Acts of the Apostles 5.18 says, Those who should not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully settled, or, evil will allow, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? So Peter has given us a promise. Time is short. Be clear-minded. Be a prayer warrior. Now the Apostle Peter understands the danger of being caught in spiritual darkness. In Matthew 26, 40, it says, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was under great pressure, he went and he asked the disciples, pray for me. And he went away and he prayed. When he came back, what did he find? Sleeping. They were asleep, weren't they? He said, could you men not keep watch for one hour? And he specifically directed that question to the Apostle Peter. He said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. So Peter was given as his counsel. He knows the danger falling into spiritual darkness. In verse 8, 1 Peter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. And so Peter is talking about unconditional love. So when someone disappoints you, or lets you down, or hurts you, or, or says things that, that are hurtful, Peter says, have unconditional love for them. Everybody asked Jesus, how often should we forgive? And Jesus said 490 times. Which is a throwback to the 490 year, pro 490 year prophecy. Jesus is saying that there's never a reason not to forgive. 
Remember the Lord's Prayer. Father, forgive us of our, son, of our sins as we have already forgiven those who have sinned against us. So he said, love each other unconditionally. And then Peter finishes it when he says, offer hospitality one to another without grumbling. We had a gentleman in church um, when I was pastoring in South Dakota. He and his wife always brought a lot of food for Paul. And he always grumbled about the people who didn't bring much food. There's some people who brought just enough for one person. And he would grumble. Peter says, don't grumble. Count it a joy to be hospitable. Count it a joy to be kind and compassionate to others. So when you're tempted to grumble, remember the words of Jesus. He said, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. He said, rather be hospitable. One In Titus 1, 8, Paul says, rather he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And we do all this without grumbling. So Peter's counsel for us, for end time believers, is to be clear minded, to be prayer warriors, to love one another, one another unconditionally, and to offer hospitality without grumbling. And it's so easy to grumble, isn't it? You look at this dish that looks delicious, and you see all those mushrooms. <laughs> Peter says, don't grumble. Don't grumble. That makes it better. <laughs> Have mercy. God needs for his church to have spiritual revival. Peter's given us the ingredients for spiritual revival. When the church becomes more than a crowd, it becomes spiritually powerful in a hostile world. That's what God wants for us. And that's what communion is about. Praying for one another, encouraging one another, submitting to one another. And so this morning, we're going to participate in the foot washing service. And if you're a guest or a member and you really are prepared for it, you're more than welcome to stay in, in the pews and relax. And um, God will be playing some soft music for us. But straight out these doors to the fellowship hall is where the family units can be having the foot washing service. And out to our right, to my right anyways, to this education building, the red door is where the men will go for foot washing service. And all the way down to the blue door is where the ladies will be participating and foot washing service. So I hope that someone in each of those groups will, will um, self-appoint themselves to, to lead in singing and rejoicing and praising God. Let's pray for you before we separate. Father in heaven, I thank you that you give us this service, this communion service, specifically this foot washing service, so that we can humbly surrender ourselves to our spouses, to our family, to brothers and sisters in Christ. So that we can be more than just people who are who, who have known about the Word, but people who know Jesus. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.